thank you all for coming out here today. Um, on behalf of the Northwestern ACS student chapter, uh, I wanted to welcome two preeminent legal scholars on constitutional law as they're here to talk about one of the most pressing legal issues of our time, which is uh, how do we pursue the constitutional mandate of equality when it seems as though ideological divisions have made progress impossible? Um, Professor Tsai, here on my right, uh, set out to tackle this question in his new book, Practical Equality, uh, which will be on sale at the back of the room at the end of the event. Uh, and Professor Tsai will be sticking around to sign copies as well. Um, he's coming here from Washington, DC, where he teaches constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law. Uh, just on the other side of him is Professor Aziz Huck, who is coming from another law school in Chicago that we don't like to talk about too much. Um, Professor Huck's academic writing focuses on constitutional and criminal law, and he recently published an excellent piece titled Fourth Amendment Gloss in our very own Law Review. Uh, so without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to our guests. Thank you, Russell. Thank you to the other... Wow, that's quite loud. Is that all right? Are we good sound-wise? OK. Uh, thank you to the, uh, to the ACS chapter here at Northwestern for organizing this event, and in particular, uh, inviting us aside, coming from out of town, and uh, speaking about an uh, important uh, project. Uh, what we hope to do in uh, the 35 or 40 minutes that we have before opening up questions is to have a conversation, not to have a, a, a lecture either by him or, or by me, more importantly, you don't want lectures by me, um, about the particular claims, but also the motivation uh, behind uh, uh, size terrific but practical equality. And um, I, you know, I thought that I would start this off by uh, kind of framing two questions that are important to lawyers, and I, I'm going to pursue each of those questions in turn, if that's okay. Uh, one is about uh, what the term equality means, and, and the second is uh, why it's so difficult a term to employ in legal and political discourse, right? And I think that sets up uh, the central project of practical equality, which paradoxically, notwithstanding the title, is to offer a suite of alternative legal and ethical strategies of argumentation in order to achieve the goals that might have been achieved through equality talk, but which are stymied in the present political environment. Right? But I think to get to that point, we need to, to have on the table some sense of well, what are we talking about when we talk about equality, and, and what's the problem of, of talking about equality. So let me, let me start you off on the first one. I'll Absolutely. Give you a... First of all, let me, let me thank all of you for coming um, for Taco Smokey. Um, uh, and uh, thanks to ACS for hosting this, of course, and thanks uh, to Aziz for, for, for uh, engaging uh, with me in this conversation. Um, for me, equality is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a basic value, and, and the book is pitched to people who consider themselves egalitarians, and I hope all of you uh, are such people. Um, and we do have to have some basic understanding of, uh, of, of A, that equality is important, and B, some minimal, I think, conception of equality. And what I start with is just with, 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 is a, a sort of notion of equality that I think most people can accept, uh, and that is that that people ought to be treated uh, the same if they're in similar situations. Now, why do I start with that sort of minimal conception? Because anything thicker than that, we start to get into all kinds of trouble. Right? We, get to, we start to get into all kinds of trouble conceptually. Uh, some people prefer formal equality. Uh, other people prefer uh, anti-subordination, some sort of aggressive notion of equality. Uh, and then also, I think that we run into other kinds of problems. Uh, we run into practical obstacles, which I talk about. Um, one of those uh, that we routinely run into is a concern that if, if, if we accept some people's claim for equality, then we might be degrading the social good that's at that issue. Uh, we see this in the, in the fight words, uh, whether same-sex couples should be able to access the institution of marriage. Uh, we, we saw that historically when it came to the social good of education. Um, and so that's one of the practical concerns. And what we often see is that when people have those uh, reservations, they end up adjusting their conceptual notion of equality to avoid 
those practical uh, obstacles. And so that's one of the, the concerns that I talk about. But that's sort of where we start. Yeah. Let me let me let me push you with a, a, a legal case um, that I, I hope uh, uh, invites you to talk about what your definition of equality, which which I, I was very struck that it's in the notes. It's not in the main text, right? It's in the, uh, right at the beginning of the of, of, of the of, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the the end notes to the uh, to the project or to the book. Um, let, let me offer you a case which I think pushes you to uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about the limits of your conception of the policy. Uh, and the case uh, it's useful to start with a case that doesn't I think trigger strong moral intuitions. Mm -hmm. And the one that I think is useful, uh, at least that I found useful with my students, is Hunt versus Washington State, uh, Apple uh, growers, really, right? So this is a stack. This is a case for those of you who have uh, not encountered it yet in uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, domain, in which the state of North Carolina imposes a labeling requirement on all apples that are sold in the state. And, and the labeling requirement is you either have a North Carolina certified label, or you have a label that is uh, promulgated or, or authorized by the US Department of Agriculture. No other labels are allowed. And uh, uh, the Trade Association for Apple Growers in Washington State sues North Carolina and says, no, this is, this is unconstitutional because, and here's where it hooks into a policy, because this is imposing an unequal burden, an unequal burden on Washington apples, because we have our own label, and it is inequitable to subject us to a rule that prohibits us from using our own, own label, right? So, so to my mind, the, the, the Hunt case is, is helpful because it, 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 it forces us to ask, well, first of all, what does it mean to say that two things are equal? And second, uh, what does it mean to say that we're treating things equally, right? Why isn't it enough for North Carolina to say, as they, as they do in their brief, well look, apples and apples, right? We're not treating apples and oranges alike, we're treating apples and apples alike. And we're actually subjecting them to the same rule. Everything has to have the same label, okay? So, so you gave a definition under which uh, I think that the, the, the state of North Carolina is right, but I, I, that's not how the case turns out. So tell us a little bit more about you know, what does your definition leave out, sure. and why did you choose a definition that, that I think, as you know, right, leaves a lot off the table. Yeah, it, so that's a great, a great example. It's not technically, as you pointed out, an equality case, but there's a form of the argument that does, uh, that, where there's a whiff of equality, right, because um, the, the, there's a claim that, that somebody's apples, or if you prefer, somebody is being treated differently. The, the, the out of red, out of state apple grower, apple apple shipper is being treated differently. Um, and you know, I think what what, what the example uh, at least illustrates is that it's helpful to think about the nature of the burden that is being imposed on the out of state apple shipper. And um, and that's sort of the approach that I uh, pursue in this book, which is to invite readers if they care about equality to just ask themselves more specifically about the nature of the burden that is being imposed on some social group. Whether it, uh, we're talking about refugees, or we're talking about um, another group of migrants, or we're talking about a racial or religious minority, to think about the actual burdens that are being imposed on that group. So here we would do, I think, a similar thing. We ask ourselves, well, what is, what is the burden that's being imposed on, on this out-of-state group, and whether it's the kind of burden that we ought to, we ought to care about. And that's the sort of practical aspect of it. And maybe that the answer is that we don't really think it's as important as some of these other kind of, kind of burdens. Or it might be that we decide collectively that um, the economic burdens, or maybe it's more than economic burdens, it really is um, starting to feel like treating out-of-state people differently from in-state people in some way. So I think that's, that's how I would invite um, people to think about, think about that about that sort of example. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to, the idea, if I'm, if I'm picking up on you, it, on, on, on the, the gist of what you're saying is, is we, we, there's a value in bypassing hard questions about what things are like or not like, and, and what it means to treat somebody equally or not equally, right? The, the other example I could have used is pregnancy, where what does it mean to treat pregnant um, workers, for example, equal to non-pregnant workers, right? Well, how, how, does, how do you identify the relevant class of non-pregnant workers? What does it mean to treat people equally or non-equally? 
one can one can play that out. But what you're saying is, what I hear you saying in just now is, look, we need to set. It's best to set aside those questions and to go directly to the harms or the burdens that a particular policy uh, involves. Right? Right. So, so, and this, I think this helps tee up the second question that I, that I wanted to ask, which is, which is why do that? Why? You've already, already referred to one reason, but um, in reading the book, it's one thing that's striking is how pervasive equality talk is in our actual political and legal discussion. So I, I deliberately drew a, an example outside of the equal protection domain. But there are examples in the free speech domain, there are examples in the uh, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, Eighth Amendment domain, uh, there are um, examples in, in popular discourse around, uh, for example, what uh, kinds of Halloween costumes people should wear, right? I'm sure everyone is aware of the, uh, the Virginia I think at this point, can we call it a kerfuffle? It's not a, it's stopped being a, a scandal, it's now just a kerfuffle. Something happened. Yeah, something happened. We're not sure what it was, but something happened. And it was about equality, right? Nobody thinks that, that Warner, sorry, not Warner, uh, Northam, uh, would have been criticized in the way that he was criticized had he uh, dressed up as a quote-unquote minstrel and been black, right? The, the, the criticism would have been, maybe there would have been criticism, but it would have been a very different kind of criticism. Right. One of my colleagues, as some of you probably know from above the law, recently repeatedly used the N-word in class right? and was subject to a fair amount of criticism because he's, his social positioning is such that it's not clear that his use of the, that word is, is, uh, is, is neutral, let's say. Um, throughout political and legal discourse, that is, one sees arguments being made about equality. And yet, and I think this is the, the, the provocative thing about your book, and yet you say, no, 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 if you are interested in progressive social change in particular, we need to give up that talk. We need to give up this pervasive vocabulary of saying that is not equal, or you are not the, uh, uh, you are generating inequality, right, by taking an action, right? So tell us a little bit about why that provocative claim that this pervasive feature of social and, right. and legal talk ought to be put to one side. So, so I think the argument isn't to, to give it up completely. Uh, we, do, we do need equal, the, the equality talk that we're referring to. There are times when the sort of big stick, as I call it, is necessary. And, and mostly it's when we're talking about a, a marginalized group uh, that has been completely shut out at some um, particular social good. So in the, in the VMI case, we need the equality talk because women are being um, completely excluded from that institution. Same-sex couples need the equality talk in order to get, to break the door down to get access to, to marriage. But there are a lot of other examples where equality talk comes up, gets used, it, it might, might even be preferred um, by activists and lawyers, but where it might not be the best way to go in order to reduce the harms that we're talking about to lift the unequal burdens. Um, and indeed, using the Equality Talk might run us into the same kind of obstacles um, that, that I talk about in the book, right? Um, so, I'm sorry, just yes, tell, us, tell us a little bit about those obstacles. Sure, right? absolutely. So, so, I, so I take it that there's a kind of, there's a thread of the argument that, particularly on the progressive side, right. you reliance upon this, this underdetermined idea of equality has a risk of backlash or uh, perverse and undesirable outcomes. Right, so some of the perverse and undesirable outcomes are, and I think this is just part of uh, why the equality discourse is so powerful, right? That it's a moral idea, um, and so part of saying that someone has treated you unequally in this basic sense is to call out somebody for having violated this basic notion of equality, right? And, um, and, and so, for example, if someone is um, committed racial discrimination or religious discrimination, part of making somebody whole is to call out the perpetrator, call them a bit. The problem, though, is, of course, then what happens when you run into people who um, are worried about uh, stigmatizing or labeling someone a bit? Can someone come back from that sort of stigma? I think that's one of the questions that's sort of up in the air right now, because so much is being described as racist or, or, or um, exactly religious bigotry. 
The example I give is the, is the litigation over the, the travel ban. Uh, and that for most people, uh, looking at that travel ban, um, we saw what uh, Donald Trump said about the, what he was going to do if he was ever elected. He's, he appeared to do what he said he was going to do. And so a lot of people look at that travel ban as an expression of religious animosity. But it turns out that even early on, we saw in the litigation below, even in the Ninth Circuit, which is generally seen as fairly friendly to these kinds of arguments, there was reticence to, I think, declare the president a religious bigot. Um, it, you know, if you look at back at the, at the, at the sort of um, oral argument, one of the judges immediately was saying things like, well, he didn't exclude all Muslims, so I don't see enough evidence here that this is ought to be treated as religious bigotry. Um, and, but the great thing about that example is, even though it's clear they're not going to get um, to a 3-0 decision uh, declaring the policy a violation of the equality provision, they do something that I advocate in the book, which is they go on a different uh, ground. They use the fairness idea as a way of, li of lifting some of the unequal burdens that the travel <coughs> had imposed uh, on Muslim travelers. So uh, if you recall, what they did was they said that um, the policy violated due process in a number of ways. It changed certain kinds of expectations. And those expectations didn't turn on whether somebody was a citizen or not. That's one of the problems we run into with this sort of straight ahead equality talk is we run into the obstacles <coughs> of who deserves equality. And right there we know that some, some classes of people in society, um, there will already be uh, reservations about um, uh, declaring them full members of society. So uh, refugees, non-citizens, prisoners, um, uh, and, and I also People who are convicted, people uh, convicted. for example, for yeah. the, the example of exclusions from the franchise on the basis of a former criminal conviction exactly. is another nice illustration. Yeah, and point. that's a great one too, because, and, and there's another move we make in the law, right? We say, oh, it's not because of their status, it's because of their conduct. It's because of something that they did, even if the thing that we say they did was years and years ago. Um, that, that distinction, that, that legal fiction, we, we use quite a lot. Um, just like the, the, the distinction between citizens and non-citizens. Um, we're in a moment, I think, now where uh, some people are trying to push that distinction just as far as uh, it can go, but how far can we take it? Does that mean that um, we can do anything we want right, to non-citizens? And I think that this is an unanswered question, one that equality as a discourse doesn't really, or is, it's going to run into trouble helping us to solve. And so sometimes these other arguments will do some good. So, so I, I want to come back to the citizenship line because I think it's an interesting uh, one and I think it poses problems for all of the proposals that you have in the, in, in the book. Um, but let, let's, let's, let's move from the, uh, what you might call the critical part of the proposal <coughs> or, or the argument, which is uh, progressives should not rely on equality because equality talk has a number of practical or uh, uh, strategic uh, difficulties associated with it. And, and therefore, we need to find substitutes. And I take the main project of the book to be the identification of alternative strategies. Some of them are legal. Some of them are uh, ethical. Uh, they're, 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 they're modes of argumentation uh, in order to achieve the same end. And you, and you give four, uh, and I'm, I'm going to butcher them, but I, I believe it's fair play, which I, I take it to be a form of procedural justice. Yep. Uh, the second one is rationality review, the, the demand that when someone takes a, particularly when the state takes an action, that action is is justified on, on uh, uh, at least by, by some kind of reason. Uh, a concern about cruelty, anti-cruelty, and then a concern about speech and the liberties of speech. So, and the claim is, is that these four provide alternative pathways whereby one can achieve the progressive ends of equality. So maybe pick, can I ask you to pick sure. one or two of them? Yeah. Maybe do all four, probably is a little different. Yeah, it's a little different. So, so I, I already alluded to the travel ban as, as one example. It's not, it's not a, a perfect solution to some of the more uh, robust claims of inequality that are raised there, right? Um, you're not going to get a de declaration that the president is a religious bigot. You're not going to get any kind of a massive expansion of the, of the social good in question, and namely the ability to migrate unimpeded, right? These two things really, I think, um, 
to give us some difficulty here in dealing with the kinds of claims that uh, non-citizens are raising in that context. But notions of fairness, um, notions of um, anti-cruelty, um, uh, I think can do some good uh, when we're, we're talking about challenges to some of the administration's policies with respect to migrants. So some of the, some of the, some of the family separation policies, some of the changes um, in, in how they're handling asylum claims, they're going to they're going to treat they want to treat some uh, asylum claimants differently depending on where they're coming from. Right? They want to send some of them back home and demand that they apply there, and that would be a different kind of a treatment procedurally from um, claimants from elsewhere. Uh, and so I think that's an example where perhaps the procedural justice idea uh, can lift that unequal burden if someone embraces it. Um, certainly, the conditions of these camps and the policy of separating um, family members. Um, uh, as a way to deter migration generally. Uh, uh, one can attack it on this uh, anti-cruelty grounds, uh, even if you're not willing to say that they're the same, you know, these people are the same yeah. kind of people as full citizens of this political community. Can, can, can I ask you to step back and give us a couple of historical examples, or maybe one historical example, right, the far more than one in the book, of instances in which advocates and lawyers have relied upon what you give as alternatives to equality and prevailed, or instances in which they ought to have relied upon one of uh, the alternatives to equality that you proffer, and because, <coughs> arguably because of their failure to do so, a cause or a, a, a claim on behalf of a litigant uh, flounders. Sure. Um, I, probably the most contemporary example I give in the book um, is um, McCluskey versus Ken. So most of us. No McCluskey versus Kent because um, it involves um, a equal protection challenge to uh, the state of Georgia's uh, enforcement of the death penalty. And what we remember about that case is the court is fairly um, in insensitive, uh, that's the right word, to the claims um, of racial discrimination. That despite the fact that the Balda study um, was the most sophisticated study at that time. Uh, showing, I think since 1976 up, up through the uh, mid to late 80s, um, just how much um, the death penalty in Georgia was being applied in a racially discriminatory fashion, the, the court ends up sort of making, they have no bones with the study itself. They end up making it irrelevant by manipulating the doctrine. And so to me, this is a horrible outcome, right? Because uh, advocates ended up making the equal protection claim in kind of like a, like a full steam ahead kind of a way, and what they end up getting at the end was what I call a tragic precedent, where not only the person does the person lose, but the court manipulates the doctrine to sort of create special rules to insulate prosecutors' decisions, for example. I think that's one of the outcomes of McCluskey versus Kim. And so what I do is I go back and I retell that story, and I, I dig out um, some of Justice Powell's memos, and I show first that he was deeply concerned, you might even say obsessed, uh, with the slippery slope problem. He really thought, and he says to, this to the rest of the uh, members of the court uh, in his memos, I think that um, the McCleskey's uh, racial discrimination claim is a frontal attack to the entire legal system in America. I mean, uh, you know, this is exactly the way he puts it. And he's, you know, underlying stuff, and, 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 and in other words, he sees no way in which the racial discrimination claim can prevail without dramatically altering um, justice as we see it. And so the answer then is to totally adjust one's notion of equality, and then I think, in my view, damage the way we think about it doctrinally. And so this is deeply demoralizing, which is another feature, I think, of tragic precedence. Well, what would have been the alternative for McCluskey's lawyer? Yeah, so what, one great thing is that they buried on, and I don't remember exactly what page, there's a little reference in the, in the lawyer's briefs, and, and I hesitate to, to uh, second guess lawyers, because we're always making arguments, you know, under, um, a severe constraints of information and time and so forth. But they did sense that there was a fairness argument that could have been made, and there was actually some evidence backing up the fairness argument. And here's the fairness argument, here's the alternative argument, and that is that there were no standards, either in Georgia, uh, as, as statewide standards, or in either of these jurisdictions that appear, um, in terms of constraining a, a particular prosecutor's decision to seek death. And so, uh, and they had some evidence backing this up. And so, what I pose in the book is a question, and that is, what if, um, what if this argument had been pushed a little bit more strongly, the fairness argument? And what I suggest is, is that we might have been able to um, make the um, 
make the, make the situation more palatable to someone who's worried about institutional, disfiguring the institutions here, as I think Powell was. And, um, uh, and if we think about the kind of remedy that could have come out of that, all we could have seen instead of, of, of something, um, here's what Powell said, he's like, if he wins, then nobody can ever use the death penalty. Because there's always going to be racial disparities of some sort. So he sees no solution to this problem. But I think that if we go with the fairness route here, we can at least chip away at the problem by constraining the prosecutors, um, which according to the studies also suggest was the primary culprit, if there was one in the system, was unconstrained prosecutors um, in Georgia. And so um, this would have been a narrower remedy, but it would have been a, a powerful and important one. Because then either the state would have had to develop some sort of mechanism by which um, these decisions were routinized within the state as a whole, or a demand that individual prosecutors' offices had to you know, sort of um, develop procedures that they, that they, they, could, they had to show they could follow. To me, this is um, kind of a better answer than where the court ends up. Yeah, so, so just to be to, to, to flesh out your what the book does is what the book what the book uh, the, the, uh, the argument of the book is to develop a number of examples of this sort with respect to all of the different alternatives or substitutes for equality that uh, Professor Sai lays out. Um, and I, I, maybe rather than going down each one of those pathways, let me, let me push uh, on your argument about McCleskey in, in, from a couple of different ways. Um, and let me, let, me, let me offer you a couple of critiques and then we can maybe go back and talk through it. So, so here's one critique. So, so the power worry in McCleskey is a worry about the volume of litigation that's enabled by a particular kind of argument. But the worry in, uh, about litigation volume is being played out not just with respect to death penalty cases, which are imposed by the state and then challenged in federal court, but it's a worry that, that's being imposed in, in non-capital cases um, with respect to fairness concerns or due process concerns across the board. Right? Where is it happening? Well, the, the Supreme Court um, has a set of doctrine that regulates when collateral challenges to state criminal convictions can be brought in federal court under what's called post-conviction habeas. And since the mid-1970s, um, and in particular a case called Wainwright v. Sykes, uh, the court, and Powell is an important part of these coalitions that, that, that uh, pursue this line of, of cases, um, the court expressly evinces a concern about the volume of constitutional cases, the delay caused by the volume of constitutional cases in criminal, uh, in the delivery of criminal justice, right? And uh, says, because there are so many procedural flaws that might happen, procedural errors that might happen in the course of a trial, we will, without any sanction from Congress, right? there's a 19-year there's a period between Wainwright and when the statute, the habeas statute, is actually amended in 1996, we will impose this concatenating sequence of increasingly harsh constraints upon post-conviction challenges, precisely out of a concern for floodgates, right? Where even prior to the enactment of the, of the federal statute that today is called EDPA, which codifies a bunch of these uh, precedents and then extends them. Right? Even before Ed Pers enacted, it's really hard, really, really hard for a state prisoner who has been convicted in, in state court in a process that contained constitutional error, right? Even given the fact of constitutional error, it's really hard for that person to bring a successful habeas petition <coughs> obtaining a retrial in federal court, right? So that, that to my, the, the, and, and that only gets worse post-1996, right? Whereas to, uh, today it's, you know, you know, good luck with that habeas petition, right? right? Is the, so the, the, the history, to my mind, suggests that the, the, to, the problem that you've identified in the classic is actually quite a general problem, right? And it, it obtains with respect to any kind of argument that will unsettle the status quo. Right, at least in the criminal context. Yeah. And therefore it's going to be amenable or it's going to be vulnerable to the same kinds of blowback or political resistance or traditional resistance that you described at the finding of the power members. That's true, that's true. What, it, although, what I, I guess what I would say about that is that, um, you know, it, 
what you're raising is a question of like how much how much process does someone do? And certainly once somebody is convicted, you know, we expect that uh, we would give the states or even the courts more leeway in saying, well, you've had X, Y, or Z, two or three or four or five shots uh, at, the, at, at showing us that something has gone wrong, and we're going to make it successively harder. Um, as opposed to what I think is at stake in McCleskey, which is a front-end question, right? What is a person who has not even been convicted yet Right, entitled to as a, as a matter of fair play. Well, yeah, he's been convicted. His conviction hasn't become final, and the the the, arg the equality argument could have been raised either on direct review or habeas review. Oh, you're, you're just raising a question of at what point he, he could have raised it personally. It's it's true that one of the pra you know one of the technical problems that um, you're going to face anytime you represent uh, somebody who's been convicted of crime is whether you are raising the, the substantive constitutional claim at the, at the right moment, whether you've waived it, uh, whether, um, uh, you know, is that, whether you waived it is primarily the, the, the question you're going to have to confront. Um, I, but, but I don't think that, that that reality necessarily undermines the broader claim, which is mm -hmm. that there are certain kinds of advanced, strategic advantages, compared advantages that you might gain yeah. from making a fairness argument sometimes, as opposed to an equality argument. So, um, and the other, the other thing here too is, is that sometimes we'll see that judges or other kinds of decision makers, even if you're arguing in front of a mayor or an attorney general or something, that um, they might be more willing to, to take into account um, systemic risk, the risk that something is happening, um, when in the equal protection or equality um, form of, of, of trying to resolve a problem, we seem to be much less willing um, to act simply because there's a risk of bias. Um, so uh, in the anti-cruelty area, for example, even uh, John Roberts right, has been willing to invalidate a death sentence because he says that certain kinds of things that happen during the course of a death penalty trial uh, raise the risk. And here I'm referring to the Buck case, where a uh, defense lawyer put on an expert, and the defense lawyer's own expert, right, um, uh, said, oh yes, according to my statistical model, if you're black, you're, you know, you're more likely to re-offend. And so, right, the risk here is, is that someone has sentenced this guy to death simply because he falls into that group, because he's black. And Justice Roberts, to his credit, says this. This is probably one of the strongest sort of egalitarian statements you can find in one of his opinions. And he says it, though, but in the context of a Sixth Amendment claim, right? This is not an equality way of resolving the problem. This is a sort of Sixth Amendment procedural way of, of solving the problem. And for him, seeing it framed that way, he's willing to talk about it in a kind of egalitarian uh, fashion, but ca cabined in this sort of Sixth Amendment framework. So I think that this is a good example of, of how you can gain a procedural uh, conservative in that way. So we, we've, we've got on the table. Uh, the arguments against using the pervasive uh, uh, form for, of a quality talk. Uh, we've, we've, we've started to explore some of the arguments or, or the alternatives to equality, right? Focusing upon uh, fair play uh, as, as our uh, lead example. Let, let, let me close out with one more question because I think we should give time for, for um, folks to ask questions. I return to this question of citizenship. Um, so the Hungarian Constitutional Court. Uh, which has been effectively captured by the right-wing Fidesz government, um, last week issued a judgment on a criminal law in Hungary uh, that prohibits anyone from giving aid of any sort to a person who is not Hungarian. It's an anti-refugee law, right? an anti-migrant law. And the Hungarian Constitutional Court, to nobody's surprise, upholds the law. But in the course of upholding the law, the court says, oh, by the way, we think that if you're not Hungarian, you have no rights. Just no rights, full stop. Now, the US law doesn't quite go that far, although there are moments when we, when we get close, particularly on jurisdictional grounds. But it, I think that the phenomena, which I think is what is, I, I give the example because I think it crisply articulates it, points to the following problem. 
no matter what the claim is that you have on behalf of your client, whether it's they, they should have an entitlement to speak, an entitlement against cruelty, against torture, uh, an entitlement uh, to a certain kind of rationality in state decision making, all of those arguments run out if the state takes the view, or the, or the court takes the view, that no, you're just not a person who counts, right? If we run up, that is, to the boundary of legal or ethical compassion, um, and, and I think that boundary in contemporary discourse is, is, is becoming largely synonymous with the citizenship boundary, right? Then you're out of luck, regardless of whether your claim is one of equality or whether it sounds in due process speech or the like, right? Uh, and so what does one do, right, in a world in which the increasing strategy, and I think one sees this globally, which is my work in part is, is, is global, whereas comparative equality, as we were talking earlier, if what one sees in practice is, is not, well, you're not entitled to equality, but that you are a non-person. Non -person. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the most pressing concerns we have. And, um, we see this also in the designation of enemy combatant status, right? This is another area where um, it's, a, it's a manipulation of um, the legal categories that we have to sort of make the point that this is not someone like a prisoner, for example, who is deserving of equality or perhaps any kinds of rights. Um, I'm not as well versed about the Hungarian example, but I think the great thing about what you just described, I, I just told you everything it's, I know it's, all, it's also horrific, right? I mean, it's absolutely horrific. Um, but I guess what I would say is that the good news is, is that in, in, we, have some, um, we have some help in terms of the history and the language of the 14th Amendment, which might not be available to some, the people in other countries. And, and that language and that history shows us that it's not just about citizens. Um, um, they're about, the concern is about persons. And the example of the freed persons um, at, at slavery's end uh, people who fell into this sort of nebulous category where different jurisdictions were treating them differently um, is a very good analogy for us. And the framers of the, of the 14th Amendment, for example, were acutely concerned with, 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 I think, a version of what you're describing because some jurisdictions were, in fact, saying anybody who helped a slave, right? John Bingham um, stands up in Congress and says it is an atrocity. So he used the language of the 8th Amendment that some... Uh, people who are giving a crust of bread to a slave are being hauled off to jail. Um, and so I think we have that help. And I actually invite in the book um, uh, others to think about the 14th Amendment and this particular problem because um, Bingham and others talked about the problems facing um, slaves and then free persons in a variety of ways. And all of those ways are still connected to the underlying problem of inequality um, that they faced. But he says, this is a problem of speech, for example, when um, jurisdictions are telling people they can't um, engage in abolitionist talk. But that speech was deeply connected to the problem of slavery. Um, it's an atrocity that people are being put in jail for um, giving a shelter or food to a, a slave. That's an Eighth Amendment way of talking about it. And he goes, and he talks about other kinds of problems as fairness problems too. So for me, this is a really great um, kind of historical justification to do the work of equality in a variety of ways. And if we're practically minded, we shouldn't care quite as much in terms of how we categorize the problem. We should care about the nature of the burden and whether there's an effective way to lift it. Okay, so, so I thank you very much, Mr. Um, I, I, I think we have about 15 minutes left. And uh, we should open it up. We definitely should. Put the tacos here. So, uh, just to pick a specific example of a topic that affects law school students um, and that may be somewhat controversial to some people um, is the issue of accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act for um, for students in law school. For example, someone with a disability gets extended time to complete a law school exam. Um, I think that sort of implicates the difference between sort of equity and equality that you talk about. I was wondering how 
uh, what, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, disability is an interesting um, conundrum because um, there are ways in which we can think about how disabled people are treated or people with claims of disability are treated in which we can think about it in terms of equity, right? There's a group here, they have sort of similar problems. How is that group being treated vis-a-vis -vis some other group? Um, but in, um, in our jurisprudence, we, have, we, we made an important move, rightly or wrongly, to not, um, to kind of stop thinking about um, disability in that way, in that traditional way. And we almost made a, a left turn and, and, and started to talk about it in terms of fairness in lots of ways, and that's where the individualized assessment kind of comes from. That, that uh, I think what, what happens oftentimes is we, we, we convert claims of um, unequal treatment if someone is disabled to, ones of in, to one of individual assessment, right? Like, what, what, what is your particular need? Do you have an actual need? Um, and then are we doing enough to sort of accommodate you as to that need? But as you suggest, there are trade-offs, right, in thinking about it that way. You could be creating a huge equity problem if we think about a group as a whole. I mean, um, I don't want to give any numbers because I don't know them for sure, but I hear that in, in, in that my kids are in private school, that kids in private school, there's significant numbers of them are also getting accommodations in the way that you've described. And if there are enough of them um, being given more time and so forth, right, it, it starts to raise a potential problem of, of, of inequality. Uh, and uh, I don't have any answer to that, but that's, that's, that's I think, how that problem has developed. Um, and so maybe that's, a, that's an example of uh, pitfalls, of completely you know, changing from one form of discourse to another uh, and, and, and not being able to see right, that there's a deep connection between fairness and equality. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so in sort of turning to um, other kinds of argumentative strategies that um, maybe rely on the same moral resources as equality but use different rhetorical strategies, what are the sort of benefits or dangers to the, um, to the legal or moral concept of equality sort of looking more in the future? So if lawyers stop um, relying on the language of equality, is there going to be some kind of, um, what, what kinds of doctrinal effects do you think that would have? Yeah, that's great, that's great. So I think for, for, for those of us who call ourselves egalitarians, we worry a little bit about losing something. And I do think that one of the things that you do lose is the ability to call someone out in this deep moral way. But sometimes, I think in a given set of circumstances, you might be willing to give that up in order to lift the actual tangible burdens that some group is facing. Um, as long as you think, you're, and a lot of, there's a prediction here, right, if you're as a lawyer activist, that this is a temporary thing, this is a, po you know, this is a positive development, uh, something we can build on as opposed to something where you're being expected to take half a loaf. That's, that's, I think that's the tough calculus because um, if, if you sense instead that making this argument is going to um, kind of lock you into a position um, where you can imagine other tangible inequalities kind of festering, then I think you, you would not want to make that move. Uh, and, um, you know, I think maybe the area where uh, I have the most hesitation is using free speech as an alternative equality. I have some historical examples where um, the, the Supreme Court, for example, um, just to tell you a quick story, basically after Brown versus Board, we know there's massive resistance. One of the forms of resistance that some states engaged in, including the Commonwealth of Virginia, was to pass restrictions on what lawyers can do because they figured courts can't reach out and cases. If there's no lawyers to bring the cases, then you know they're going to right stall desegregation. So they said um, in Virginia, nobody could, no lawyer could take a case unless the lawyer or the lawyer's employer had a pecuniary interest in the outcome of the case. Well, that's that described every single public interest lawyer. You don't have a pecuniary interest in the outcome, so you couldn't do, you couldn't take any of those cases in Virginia. So um, a number of the justices said, "Hey, this is a this is an end run around Brown. This is an equality problem. Let's I'm ready to resolve it as a violation of the equality clause." Well, Frankfurter is not on board. And he makes a strong, he, Frankfurt is the power here. And he says, no way. He's like, there's, there's no language of race mentioned anywhere in this law. Um, traditionally, and this is what I mean by disfiguring the social good, um, the state has often been allowed to regulate the, the, the practice of law. 
And so if we start to push equality into this area, then it's going to interfere with the state's traditional power to regulate this profession. So he's not on, they can't get to a fifth vote uh, on the equality route. But what happens? They turn to the free speech route. And they end up describing uh, the, the litigation of this sort as a kind of political advocacy. And I say that this ends up being an alternative um, solution here, one that was not even argued in the case originally. And that changing the discourse, even subtly, allowed the court to, to what was going to be a disastrous 5-4 you know, decision or something like this, end up being, I think, something like 6-3. Uh, and it ends up being, instead of a tragic precedent, that would have stymied the work of the NAACP, and everybody saw that. Um, one where they see that there, there can be moments where equality and free speech align. Well, what about today? Well, I think there are places where they don't align. Um, I think we have to be careful um, in, in some of the, the corporate campaign speech cases, right, tell us that sometimes they, they might not align, or at least they might not align completely. If you, if you care about having egalitarian free speech um, set of principles, we're going to have to be more careful, I think, in that area. Um, it seems like a lot of your criticism about quality as a concept, mainly fixates on how we use it in a courtroom, on a legal argument, in terms of the outcomes of justices. I was wondering if you feel that that critique applies to the quality as a concept as a frame, just in broader messaging. Because, for example, recently the same sex marriage, I read studies that the shift from talking about gay marriage to marriage equality was actually very successful in shifting public opinion. Right. So, in a sense, it's a it's a common value that we all uphold as Americans a Latin party, but we've also seen how it's been distorted in issues like race, black admissions, or others, and we kind of distorted to go the other way, depending on where your views are. So is your critique in the book primarily just about how we talk about it in the courtroom and how we shift some of the same concepts to find more effective line of argument, or do you feel that across the board that equality is a loaded term or one that has a lot of risk, even just in pure messaging? Yeah, I, I think that, um the, the book is pitched in a way where um, a lot of the examples are in the courts, but they're not, not all the examples are in the courts. And so the critique of equality talk is a, is a broader critique, that sometimes we're going to run into obstacles even when we're in the much more free-flowing sphere of political activism. Um, and I think that in the, in the same-sex marriage domain, you're absolutely right that um, equality works very powerfully. I think part of the reason why it's so effective um, is of course the rapid cultural change we went through, but but um, the other part of it is that you you can pitch it as some a situation where a group has been completely shut out of the social good. I think that it doesn't have the same moral sway in other areas where um, it's not quite that clear cut. Does that make sense? I think people really feel more outraged when someone's completely shut shut out of a um, of a particular institution or social good. I think a lot of these other uh, situations, we, um, it's much more complicated, and um, and we can get really tripped up in a fight over the proper conception of equality, or uh, being tripped up over the, the kind of fear of too much equality, fearful of the consequences of what we're describing. Yeah. Yeah, kind of related to Jean's question, I'm curious how how far. <coughs> Yeah, so that's great. I, I think that you, I would agree with your instinct that in certain kinds of institutions, that, that's why I think in the McCleskey case, when we're talking about prosecutors, where we are trying to preserve discretion as well, and maybe that's also true in the employment um, scenario. Um, I think I agree with your instinct that that's another domain where you're going to run into a lot of people who really find value in pr protecting some sphere of discretion, or a lot of it, maybe too much of it. And so that means that they're going to be much more, uh, they're going to, their hackles will be raised by any form of argument um, that, that seems to, to kind of directly challenge that discretion that they've enjoyed traditionally. Whatever. And sometimes it's, there are good reasons for that discretion. Um, and in that moment, then perhaps right, a fairness argument will feel less, um, you know, less intrusive in lots of ways. That there's, we can imagine ways of uh, kind of accommodating that fear. It really depends on what we demand in terms of fairness, right? 
Um, and also, I think if you're in, um, in an institutionalist of some sort, right, talking to someone who's been in the firm or whatever for ages since they helped found it or whatever, then they're going to be acutely um, invested in protecting that institution. So, so that's a that's a great example. And I haven't really thought too much along the lines of private institutions, but there are some I think correlators there. Can I, can I just ask yeah. a, a, a follow-on question to that? So, so there was recently a survey that showed that. Among uh, millennials, so your your generation, uh, you people, no, uh, and, and among millennial men, more than fifty percent of millennial men do not believe there is a gender pay gap, right? which there is. It's, it's a pretty big one, right? And uh, my, my wife has taken to, to making my four-year-old recite, "There is a gender pay gap." <laughs> <laughs> He's very good at it. He can do it. On demand. Um, but that, so, so the, 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 the underlying study suggested to me that there's a, there's a deeper problem, which is, or there's a, there's a problem of, there's a deep problem of perception or belief about the world mm. that drives many uh, uh, forms of inequitable practice, right? right? That, 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 for example, in this context, men just refuse to believe that women are not getting paid as much, right? And, and, and it's, it's shockingly, uh, insensitive to age, right? Which on a lot of things, you know, people get there's evidence that people are more progressive if they're younger. Um, how does the how does how does one deal with that kind of problem unless one talks about it in terms of policy? Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen those studies too, and I actually believe those studies that, that show there is a there is in fact a, a gap. Um, but I think that it's right to say that a lot of the problem is about perception. Uh, how do we perceive whether there's a a, whether there's an inequality, and then B, what is the sources of the inequality that we're looking at. And um, uh, from what I've seen, uh, it's very difficult to change people's minds, like in terms of people's priors, because our priors are determined by um, where we grew up, what institutions like we grew up in, uh, what neighborhoods we grew up in, and it's important to, to, to have conversations across right, those gaps but if justice requires my developing a very coherent notion of equality and then convincing right, 50% plus one um, that my conception of equality is right, then I think the empirical evidence suggests um, A, either that's going to be a very, very long project, or B, it's a doomed project. That we've got to find some other way to justice that doesn't depend on the process that I just described. And oftentimes as lawyers and political theorists, we, we sort of assume if I can come up with the, the, the best concept of this idea, then justice will follow, right? Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, here, when, when in the problem that you describe, there's sort of inequality in terms of pay, but there's a lot of other things kind of um, as part of this, right? There's, there's this, there's also the sense that um, this is a domain where people ought to still get paid what they deserve, whatever that means. And the notion of deserve is often an individualized one for some people. And then for others, they have this sort of more of a proportional vision of the world, right? And depending on what your, what your background is, where you grew up and how you were raised and educated, you're going to fall on this spectrum. Um, so, so to me, it's important to recognize that we all fall on some sort of spectrum, and the key is to finding a way for us to get just enough people to move in the direction of lifting the burdens, um, which requires, I think, um, being willing to broaden the kind of techniques we're willing to, to use. So I think that's a nice uh, uh, summary, and uh, sort of circling back on many of the themes of the book. Um, so maybe, maybe I should... I, ask you guys to, to join me in thanking uh, Robert for a <laughs>